acknowledging that uh, King's College at Western University is located in close proximity to three vibrant fo local First Nations who have long-standing relationships with the land and place we now recognize as London, Ontario. Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, part of the Anishinaabe Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, part of the Haudenosaunee Six Nations, and the Muncie Delaware Nation, part of the Leni Lenape Nation, nation excuse me. Historically, the Attawandaran neutral peoples also once settled in this region alongside the Algonquin and Haudenosaunee peoples and used this land as their traditional beaver hunting grounds. Today, a diverse and growing indigenous population live in London and the surrounding areas. Many here tonight may not be indigenous. However, we are all treaty people along with all of the, and along with all of the responsibilities and duties that that entails. More than just a nicety or a rote ceremony, this kind of land acknowledgement helps us to pause and to remember that we all share the land and resources of this place. So the question to leave with tonight is what small step can I take today so that I may advocate for the freedom of all people and join in the stewardship of this land. This year's Veritas lecture series entitled Building Bridges Over Walls challenging, challenges us to find a new way of overcoming obstacles in living out the gospel, of bringing about healing in Christ's body and to foster the church's witness in the wider community. This year will invite artists, activists, scientists, and theologians who will lead us in conversations that will both challenge and challenge us and point us towards a hopeful future. Tonight, it's my, my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Timothy O'Malley, uh, who is going to speak to us about liturgy and the universality of the church. Dr. O'Malley, O'Malley is the Director of Education for the McGrath Institute for Church Life and the, at the University of Notre Dame. He holds an appointment there as the academic director of the Notre Dame Center for Liturgy, where he teaches courses in liturgical sacramental theology in the Department of Theology. He has authored six books, most recently Liturgical Formation in the RCIA and Off the Hook, which is about God, love, dating, and marriage in a hookup world. I've had the personal privilege of uh, attending yearly liturgy symposium at the uh, University of Notre Dame for the past several years. I have to tell you, it's a class act, so I would encourage anyone to, uh, to sign up and go. I mean, it draws top-notch theologians from all over the world, really, and largely due to the efforts of Dr. O'Malley and his team. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Timothy O'Malley. Dear friends, it's, it's a delight to be here with you, uh, to, to be here amongst friends. Uh, the, the chance, uh, I always look forward to, to seeing the cohort from Kings on a yearly basis in South Bend. Uh, and now that uh, you, now that I know you, having looked at you uh, for this brief period of time, so, so, so I know you now, um, you're more than welcome to, uh, and, and you can always come for a football game. Uh, I'm here to speak today uh, about, uh, I'm going to or, or frame the conversation around liturgical participation and inclusion. And I want to speak initially before I say some cautionary tales about the gift of inclusion. This is my son and I enjoying a uh, Giants baseball game. We weren't Giants fans, but we were in San Francisco, so we had to pretend to be. And... Uh, so that was part of the inclusion. Uh, but the deeper inclusion is my son was born with something entitled agenesis of the corpus callosum, uh, which is there is a membrane that connects your left and right hemispheres of the brain that he lacks. And in previous generations, uh, our son would not have been well taken care of. Uh, he would not have been cared for even in a, in a sort of remote way. But in the state of Indiana, in the United States, uh, from the time that he was three months old, he was given special educational uh, opportunities that he otherwise would not receive. Um, we had social workers and occupational therapists. I always wondered what an occupational therapist did with a three-month-old, but I learned. Um, he had physical therapy, and from the time he's been young, 
he's had an IEP, an individualized educational plan that's unique for him. This is an intrinsic good. Uh, it is a participation of those who, uh, for whatever reason, uh, cannot participate in the way that scholastic education unfolds, and it allows for a human development that is a matter of justice. It's somewhat like Benedict XVI said in his text, Caritas and Veritate, the theme of development can be identified with the inclusion in relation of all individuals and peoples within the one community of the human family, built in solidarity on the basis of the fundamental values of justice and peace. This deep sense of inclusion that allows a, a child like my own to receive the kind of education that allows him to flourish. He's a very intelligent child with perfect rhythm. I, I imagine he's going to be a musical genius, but of course we all do with our children. Um, but he will be. And, uh, but it allows him to flourish. This is the gift of inclusion, uh, not just in the liturgy, but in a society. But one of the things we have to ask ourselves is, but inclusion in what? What is the telos to which inclusion is directed? To what end? In a recent series of essays, the founder or, or the current president or head of Community and Liberation, Father Julian Caron, wrote an essay about dialogue in Europe after uh, the, the sort of uh, Charlie Hebdo uh, sort of massacres in, in cartoons. And what he asked was the following, and he asked this about Europe, not about Canada or the United States, but uh, mutatis mutandi. This is the true element that will decide the future of Europe. Whether Europe will finally be the place of a real encounter between proposals of meaning, different and numerous as they, be, as they may be. Space for freedom means space for saying in front of everyone, individually or together, who we are. Each makes available for everyone his or her vision and way of living. The sharing will enable us to encounter each other on the basis of the real experience of the person and not on the basis of ideological stereotypes that make dialogue impossible. The task in front of us, and I, I certainly speak as an American who's coming from the United States, who is having a little bit of a problem with dialogue in the public square. Um, <laughs> marginal. <laughs> is that inclusion, dialogue, but to what end? To what end in a world where the question is, well, is there meaning? What is the meaning that one searches for in the context of dialogue? Is there something like a common good, a search for something beyond a sheer will to power in which one actually sort of seeks to dialogue together? Uh, I suspect that in the United States, one of the reasons that Democrats and Republicans are so utterly incapable of dialogue is because both of them, shockingly, are not committed to a common good. Uh, but what is being performed is a kind of ultimate will to power. There is no telos except the telos of the performance of the political arena. We're having midterm elections soon. <laughs> and watching midterm election commercials are one of the great ascetic tasks. Uh, it should occur during Lent. <laughs> An additional dimension of inclusion is whose inclusion? Uh, this week, uh, French President Emmanuel Macron made the news. Speaking to, uh, at, with the Gates Foundation, uh, he, speaking about African uh, ed women, wrote, present me the woman who decided being perfectly educated to have seven, eight, or nine children. Please present me with the young girl who decided to leave school at 10 in order to be married at 12. In other words, France is founded on radical inclusion uh, constitutionally, laïcité, uh, uh, a kind of secularization that is enshrined in essence to create a space where all could be included. And undoubtedly the French president has a point. Uh, education is an intrinsic good. The more people who can be educated is a good. But note the implicit assumption, uh, and perhaps he was speaking to a group of people that he imagined, uh, I guess he, he forgot that Twitter existed, um, 
present me the woman who decided being perfectly educated to have seven, eight, or nine children. In other words, education and having seven, eight, or nine children are determined to be outside of one another. What's assumed is that actually the state, implicit in this, is that the state has something to say in something private like how many children one should have. One isn't arguing against Macron, for example, that a Catholic view of family life should prevail in, in the political sphere, but shouldn't there be a space for someone, I don't know, who wanted to have seven children to also, I don't know, receive an education? Inclusion often can exclude in a liberal democracy, insofar as in a liberal democracy, who is the referee? Who is the, the referee? And in this case, it's not clear. There's an ambigui ambiguity to inclusion. And so such con inclusion can, in essence, accidentally become a kind of totalitarianism. Because the logic of the system, as Rizard Lugutko writes in his the, the Demon and Democracy, Totalitarian Temptations in Free Societies, because the logic of the system turns on dialogue, respect, equal rights, openness, and tolerance, everything is, by definition, included. It's the state that should incessantly work to impose and improve cooperation policies by removing all real and potential barriers, creating a favorable legal environment, and reshaping public space and education in such a way that the people's minds internalize the rules of politically correct thinking. Now, Ludgutko is a conservative, but the point that he brings up is something to consider in inclusion, which is who forces or brings about inclusion? Who forces and brings it about? Is it the state? Can the state do it? What capacity does the state have to do it? Certainly some capacity, but to what degree does the state have enough power to present um, total uh, openness to inclusion? Uh, let me concretize this. When you work with children, which I do, not, not college students, I work with college students uh, who are not children, but when I work with young children, um, often it's very difficult uh, to, to force inclusion, right? Um, Imagine you have young children, as I do, and you say, Tommy, you have to include so-and-so. Tommy and his friend's response could be, uh, no. Or, yeah, we will, but we'll let that person know that they're included for the sake of inclusion. This is one of the first things parents learn. What you need to do with Tommy in my case, is teach him to want to include, to desire inclusion. That actually a pure sort of legal parameter, although necessary to a certain degree, is actually insufficient uh, for, for creating a, a true sort of society of peace, of harmony, one where the common good operates. That is, the problem of inclusion isn't simply a problem of the state, it's a problem of culture. It's a problem of a society, it's a problem of relationship. And in fact, we know in the United States, where I come from, that inclusion often tends to sort of form in enclaves. Um, recently, Pew has released a series of data that describes how American Catholics think about um, political issues depending upon their party affiliation as Republicans or Democrats. So you would think Catholics might have a sort of common view on certain things but they don't. Opinions about immigration. Among Republicans, all Republicans, the percent that say that immigrants strengthen our country because of their hard work and talents is 42%. 44% see immigrants as a burden on our country because they take our jobs, housing, and health care. Catholics, among Republicans, 47%, 5% more than the average, believe immigrants strengthen our country. 42% see them as a burden. 
Among Democrats, there's a radical difference. 84% see immigrants as strengthening our country, while 12% see them as a burden. 86% of American Catholic Democrats see immigrants as a strength, and 11% see them as a burden. These enclaves of inclusion mean that parishes are often forming in the United States around those who hold specific views, right? So uh, we will include all are welcome except those who, are, who think differently than me, right? And it's not even noticed. These are enclaves of inclusion that um, simply like-minded people hang out with like-minded people. Uh, abortion actually has a similar sort of status in the United States. 70% 70 of American Catholic Democrats say abortion should be legal in all or most cases, whereas 35% of Republicans say that it should be legal in all or most cases. So there's a radical gap here between a sense, th th there's a kind of enclaves established in American Catholicism today around who's in and who's out. And all you have to do is spend 15 minutes on Twitter to see this performed. My Twitter feed consists of a series of people who either hate the Pope or who have prepared for his canonization. <laughs> Those are the two options. Lastly, there's a problem of a kind of colonialism that which inclusion operates. And this is operative in the United States, particularly among Hispanic Catholics, where you often hear in dioceses, we really ought to include more Hispanic Catholics. This notion um, operates, one, absurdly, because amongst American Catholics, 60% are Spanish-speaking right now. So including Hispanic Catholics are like including hockey fans in Canada. <laughs> okay, so they're, they're, they, they're part of, the question is, is should the Hispanic Catholics include uh, the Germans? Second, it makes the assumption that inclusion is a matter of one group of people performing some radical act of charity whereby the other group of people is welcomed in. It's a, it, it, it functions as a kind of colonialism, right? Um, yes, we should have more Spanish-speaking Catholics in our parish. How do we get them to join us? This is radically against what the church views the church to be. So what I'd like to do for the rest of our time together is to suggest, one, how to move somewhere different than this. Inclusion unto itself is not a sufficient category for, for Christians. Although it has benefits to them, uh, and I've acknowledged those benefits, it requires something deeper. It requires something from divine revelation, a, a kind of Eucharistic ecclesiology. And then I want to suggest some ways that we would think about the liturgy as an engine of inclusion in a way that's perhaps different than we would think about. Rather than think, well, how do we include people in the liturgy? How does the liturgy actually foster and enable inclusion? So, as we all know, the Eucharist, as a sacrament, is not reducible to an encounter with the totality of divine presence. Even as early as uh, uh, Augustine, as we'll see today, the Eucharist both forms the church in this intimate encounter with the totality of divine love, at the same time that the church then, in receiving this sacrament, becomes this source of unity, becomes this radical love. You, you find this reflected often in 20th century thought in someone like the Orthodox theologian uh, John Zazulus, the Holy Eucharist in its communal and ecclesial character is the Pentecostal eschatological community par excellence, a community which experiences and witnesses to the entrance of the eschaton into history and offers a taste of the kingdom to come. That is, the church is not reducible to in the United States, the church is often understood as a community of like-minded individuals who happen to just agree on the same things, right? It's an optional society, a kind of lion's club, 
or Kiwanis Club. I don't know the equivalent clubs. Uh, it's, you got them? Okay, great. It's those clubs of like-minded persons who just happen to hang out with one another on Sundays. That's not what the church is. The church comes together in a radically different way. I want to begin with this history of a kind of Eucharistic communion with Augustine of Hippo. In his City of God, Augustine composes a work in which at the very center of this city of God and the city of the human person, he places the Eucharist, the sacrifice of Christ that brings the city together. He writes in the middle of this work in Book 10, after the apostle had exhorted us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God, our reasonable service, and not to be conformed to this world, but to be reformed by the renewal of our mind. So here Augustine's quoting Romans 12. He went on to say, For by the grace of God given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more of yourself than you ought to think, but to think temperately, as God has assigned to each his measure of faith. For just as in one body we have many members, so we, although many, are one body in Christ. Then Augustine notes something essential. Here, it's a common Pauline idea, right? The church is Christ's body, which doesn't mean, as it often gets reduced in the United States, to a kind of stewardship narrative, where the church is Christ's body, which means um, everybody should give a little bit of their talents. I don't actually disagree with that. Uh, people should give their talents. But that's, if all Paul was saying is, you know, it's really important that we all contribute to this organization, then um, there's really no reason that anyone rejected him. But Paul says something else. Paul says, we are one body in Christ. This term in Paul is actually taken from a political reference, the Soma Christau. The body of Christ is a Stoic term representing um, the, the political social organization in which all human beings would come together, uh, all sort of citizens, really, uh, so not all human beings, all men, citizens would come together to perform political work. In Christ, there is one body, but it includes all. It is an ontological reality, a reality at the level of being. This is the sacrifice of Christians, although many, one body in Christ. And this is the sacrifice that the church continually celebrates in the sacrament of the altar, where it is made plain to her that in the offering sh she makes, she herself is offered. For St. Augustine, there is not an issue of... The, the goal is the inclusion of all humanity in this sacrifice of love. It's not... The Eucharist intrinsically points towards the redemption of all humankind. At the conclusion of City of God, he describes heaven. And it, it doesn't look like precious moments heaven. Um, <laughs> instead... It is the city of saints gathered together who have become praise. A city that has become praise. Um, I know that you all are having an election. Cities don't tend to, be, to become praise, right? They become, uh, they fight, they argue. Um, this is not a bad thing because there are things worth arguing over. But we do not dwell in perfect harmony. I mean, how many times... Has your neighbor annoyed you? Or your neighbor in church annoyed you because they sing out of tune? In heaven, no one sings out of tune. Or it doesn't sound out of tune. There is no more out of tune. In Augustine, all members of the body are made part of this communion, and this is the sacrifice that's offered. But Augustine isn't naive about this, right? He doesn't think this happens automatically. He's not of the sense like, well, once we do the Eucharist, then people are, are, are in harmony. Uh, he, involved, he was involved too often in, in radical disharmony, whether you're talking about the Donatists uh, or, or uh, Pelagians or even arguments among his own community. In, the, in his sermons on the Psalms, Augustine describes the kind of formation that's necessary to be at one in this Eucharistic communion, to think about oneself as a member of a choir of saints. In his sermons on the Psalms 150, he preaches, the Psalm is as good as saying, you are his saints, for you are his strength. 
but only because he deploys his strength in you. You are his powerful ones. You are the vast extent of his greatness. You are the trumpet, the psaltery, the lyre, the drum, the choir, the strings, the organ, and the cymbals that sound so splendid because they are attuned to each other. You are all these instruments, and when you listen to the psalm, do not think of anything in this orchestra as worthless or transitory or lacking in dignity. In the church for Augustine, every member of this communion of saints in Via on the way is part of an in tune orchestra or an orchestra that is tuning itself. Inclusion is work for Augustine. It's, it's hard work because it's participation in a communion that we did not create. It's a communion that's received. It's a sacrifice of love for Augustine because it's the sacrifice that we as human beings can't offer. The sacrifice that we offer is a violent and bloody one. It's the sacrifice of mimetic desire, of the desire to remove the person from community so that we can come together. Think about how sports work or schadenfreude, the delight everyone takes probably here in this room and watching the Montreal Canadiens lose. <laughs> when you see the Canadiens lose, why do you delight in this? Um, because, well, maybe not everyone does, but you delight in this because to remove this member of the community gives a sort of sense of identity unto oneself. This is the sacrifice of humankind. Christ comes to offer another sacrifice. It's the sacrifice of love into the end. And this is the heart of Augustine's Eucharistic ecclesiology. But Augustine is not alone. This theme is picked up in the 19th century uh, astutely in Matthias Schieben in his Mysteries of Christianity. There, in a world that's radically changed, Augustine is not dealing with nation states yet. Um, Schieben is. The church is a most intimate and real fellowship of human beings with the God-man, a fellowship that achieves its truest and most perfect expression in the Eucharist. If the God-man dwells in the church in so wonderful a manner as to associate with himself with all its members to form one body, then evidently the unity in which he joins them is so august and so mysterious that no human mind can conjecture or understand it. And if through the agency of his unity, he draws the members of his church up to and into himself in order to permeate them with his divine power and glory, to offer them in himself as an infinitely pleasing sacrifice, this mystery induces in us the realization that we can never think too highly of the nature and importance of the church. For the church is for Sheban, in the Eucharist, the offering of all humanity unto God all humanity in all of its sorrow, in all of its sadness, in all of its joys, all of this is offered up to God. The church must be inclusive for Sheban, for that is who she is. That is the universal dimension of the church. This is also taken up by the Anglican theologian and writer on the liturgy, Evelyn Underhill. In her lovely work, The Mystery of Sacrifice, which I recommend deeply to those of you who want a deeper appreciation of the Eucharistic life. She writes about the act of communion, right? This moment, which often can be perceived as so individualistic, right? Um, well, at least in orderly societies. Um, in societies where people just walk up wherever they want, it doesn't feel that way. But, but in societies where people properly get in line and wait. Um, in this act of communion, there's nonetheless a, a calling for a fraternalness, a, a love that, that moves well beyond um, an individual reception. As with each communion, God unites himself more deeply with the humble and receptive soul. So too, each soul is more and more deeply united with the community of God-loving souls, woven into the fabric of the church. As its union with God deepens, so more and more it is conscious of this incorporation in the life of the body. Here we reach out under veils to the heart of the divine creative action. God, the fountain of life, by a generous and ever-renewed self-giving, making out of the raw material of humanity the agents of his infinite self-giving love. Making, by a generous and ever-renewed self-giving, 
making out of that raw material of humanity the agents of his infinite self-giving love. The church is, a, is to be, through the Eucharist, a vision of a total unity on the way, but a unity of human beings given over to self-giving love. Uh, concretized this in a really uh, a narrative that, that placed this to mind. I was at a wedding once, a Filipino wedding, uh, of some friends uh, in Evanston, Illinois, and they were high school sweethearts. And one so rarely encounters such uh, weddings, so it had a lot of joy to it. And it was this extraordinary Filipino wedding where literally every single member of the family processed in. It was the longest procession. Anyone who paid for anything at the reception was involved in the procession. It was extraordinary. And uh, the couple made their, uh, offered consent, they made their vows, and the Eucharist was to begin. And at this moment, a woman walked in off the street of Evanston uh, and walked directly up to the altar and put her hands on the altar. And, and the priest knew her well. She was, um, she was uh, one of the women who were w without a home in Evanston. And so he knew her, and he talked to her, and th the bride and the groom then uh, actually became Eucharistic ministers, and he spoke with her, and then at the end, she joined in this massive pr 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 procession out of the church. Uh, this is, in essence, the kind of communion that we're called to. It's a love that draws, us, draws all in, all of humanity in. It's an inclusion that breaks the bounds of what's even possible in inclusion. It destroys the rationality of inclusion. And of course, this is what the city needs, and this is my, our last example. In the Anglican theologian Graham Ward, we find in his book, The Politics of Discipleship, where he speaks um, as a kind of practical adaptation to his work, Cities of God, that in the city, what we receive in the Eucharist, and thus what makes inclusion possible, a true communal love, is that we first receive this love. That we stand not as those who include or uninclude, but actually are first those who are included. For God's love, the sacrifice in the Eucharist, is that love which includes us first. In God, God is the first includer. Those who act and those who are the recipients of such action are incorporated into Christ in an eternal reciprocity of giver and given that begins with the asymmetrical sacrifice of Christ himself and shears off into the intra-Trinitarian nature of God's own being. This is not a sacrifice that we can offer. I always compare the Eucharistic sacrifice functionally. Um, when I was young, my parents would give me... Um, money to buy them Christmas gifts at the little place that would pop up in the mall, and I would go and buy the most absurd Christmas gifts. Now that I'm an adult, I look at those things and I think to myself, oh no, I'm so sorry, parents. Um, I really could have gotten you anything better. Uh, but no matter how many times I got them uh, a candle or a Ren and Stimpy uh, uh, sort of creature, there was a delight in, in this because the point was the infinite gift of love they had and the small gift in return. I received the gift first. And so inclusion and thus political discipleship, that is our act of including all in this divine kingdom, begins first with recognition that the kingdom is not ours to give. It comes to us. We are first citizens, made citizens uh, in this city, which means that our first posture rather than Condemnation is gratitude. So, Eucharistic participation, I would argue, is in fact a better term within the church to think about liturgical inclusion than inclusion. It's the most radical form of inclusion. For as we hear in Sacrosanctum Concilium, in the Second Vatican Council's document on the liturgy, Mother Church earnestly desires that all the faithful should be led to that fully conscious and active participation 
and liturgical celebrations which is demanded by the very nature of the liturgy. Such participation as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a redeemed people is their right and duty by reason of their baptism. In the Eucharist, we have, uh, in all the liturgy, but in particularly the Eucharistic sacrifice, there is a, a way in which all Christians are to offer themselves, to be included in this participation. And I want to describe some then concrete ways that we can think about inclusion, and then I'll be done for the evening. I think the first consequence as we think about inclusion is actually expanding what we mean beyond a full conscious and active participation, beyond rational sincerity. Uh, the picture above is a community of sisters, of nuns in Europe that are entirely uh, women with Down syndrome. And the second is what, I mean, as Pope Francis, uh, I wish Pope Francis would come to my church and help me with my kids, although it seems like in this image he's not helping. <laughs> One of the problems with full conscious and active participation as it's often been interpreted is it's often meant something like comprehensible understanding and really meaning what you mean. It's a rationality, a kind of sincerity where what really matters is the, the intention of the person who's engaging in the act. By its nature, this, this excludes a variety of people. Children and those who suffer at all from developmental, physical, uh, uh, sort of impairments. In both cases, the measure of inclusion as do you understand what's going on is not met. A six-month-old doesn't know what's happening at Mass, nor for that matter does necessarily, or at least understand in the way that we understand it, a 25-year-old with Down syndrome. But if we take our Eucharistic ecclesiology seriously, both members, children and those who at all have such disabilities, are meant to radically participate. In this case, we have to recognize an understanding of participation that is beyond verbal, that's beyond sort of pure rationality, a participation that is designed to actually invite all of us in with all of our senses. This opens up conversations about, well, what do we do with beautiful spaces? And why do we use incense? How do we welcome, which isn't, by the way, now a conversation about whether one is conservative or progressive. It's a conversation about the senses and what does it mean to include the full dimension of the human person in the act of worship. My son's first act of worship was a stained glass window, not because he was particularly pious, it was just the first thing he ever saw in a church. He was wearing a penguin suit, like a literal sort of penguin suit. He only wore it once. It was my favorite outfit. Um, if we ever have a child in the winter again, they shall wear the penguin suit. But... It was the, his first conception of the, of the wonder of divine love, uh, of inclusion in this act of worship, was the way that light played with color. My own parish takes this quite seriously. We will often have special liturgies to welcome those in with developmental delays for First Communion. Um, many children, many young children, many older children, uh, who suffer from such delays can't take most of what's happening at our regular liturgy. The, so the sounds are very intimidating. The lights are harmful. Uh, they hurt. They hurt. And so our parish will hold particular first communions for these families that are designed around the participation of this child in the Eucharistic life of the church. We must take this more seriously. We also must think uh, of an inclusion related to enculturation, uh, linked to what the church has called the traditio et the reditio. Uh, 
That is, enculturation is not, as it's often portrayed, as anything, right? Anything is possible. Rather, it's a reception of the totality of love, of the tradition, what has often been the creed. The creed is handed over. It's given. But the genius is that there's a reditio, the returning of the creed. It's memorized in the early church, but its memorization had a deeper meaning in the catechetical documents today. The reditio is the handing back with all of one's genius involved. And here we have to remind ourselves that inclusion will happily change the church. And I'll give a concrete sort of example, one that seems so mild, but um, is actually rather important. If you've ever been to Europe and seen monstrances or places where the Eucharist were contained from 1200, 1300, they were often built in churches or houses, right? So you'll see a kind of house with the Eucharist that's sort of at the center. When the missionaries, Franciscans uh, in particular, went to Mexico, they began to develop new monstrances linked to the understanding of the sun, right? So uh, bread was essential, and so in order to sort of describe the idea of a god who sacrificed himself and came back, uh, they would use the image of the sun as linked to bread, and suddenly monstrances would have sunbeams. Well, Spaniards traveled back to Spain, and they took with them these monstrances. Now, if you look at most monstrances that exist, they have sunbeams. Inclusion here is then not just a kind of benign tolerance, like, thank you, Hispanic Catholics, for being here. <laughs> it's really nice. You make the r many of us white people feel very happy. Rather, it is the transformation of the church, the very incarnation of the church into culture. So enculturation, in this sense, isn't just a, a, a kind of it's not, it, it's a term in which the church is enriched. Inclusion, because they are, because those who, every one of these people are already deeply involved in the life of the church. But participation is also ordered, and thus we have to have a sense of inclusion that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone does everything, and that in fact, one's role could be something that actually allows one to participate in a unique kind of way. The example I always give for this is within the catechumenate. It is the most radical act of non-inclusion, right, in some sense, that one takes non-baptized men and women who are catechumens and say, leave, right? I mean, is there anything more, uh, less inclusive, right? Um, welcome to the Eucharist, now leave. But of course, this is a sort of faulty sense of inclusion. Inclusion doesn't mean that everybody participates in precisely the same way. In the order of the catechumenate, this is a radical act of participation that actually reminds the baptized assembly of the importance of Eucharistic priesthood amongst the baptized. Uh, here I don't mean ordained priesthood, but the priesthood of the baptized to participate and celebrate the Eucharist on a weekly basis. That Act, that is already an act of divine worship. And so participation is ordered. Inclusion doesn't mean everyone does everything. In fact, it actually often is the case that inclusion, or, or that we, are, we will not even be included if we're participating. Uh, the example I always give to young parents is something like this. You will not attend mass. I mean, you'll go. <laughs> Let me be frank. You are there in principle. And yes, you are wandering. Uh, my, my church built these beautiful cloisters uh, that I've become very familiar with because my daughter wanders them with me. And so we wander the cloisters looking at pictures and she tries to pull on the security system. And am I excluded from liturgy? No. This is part of the divine act of worship. This is part of the sacrifice of love. This is part of what it means to belong. Lastly, and this will be the last thing I say, is that the Eucharist is itself what enables us to participate in that most important dimension of inclusion, which is dialogue with the world. 
At times, we ask too much from the Eucharist. We ask too much from the liturgical rites of the church. As the Second Vatican Council determined, um, the liturgy is the source and summit of Christian life, but it's the source and summit, which means it's a source and it's a source of this life, but there are other sources. And we must engage in serious dialogue, in serious dialogues of love, of inclusion, in worlds where there will be fundamental disagreement. The servant of God, Kira Lubick, the founder of Communion and Liberation, provides us an icon of this. In her own writing, she has deep reflections on Eucharistic communion and love and involvement. But this passage is actually taken from something she writes on dialogue. And this is the kind of dialogue motivated by a kind of love brought by the Eucharist. If we're motivated by this kind of love, other people will be able to express themselves because they feel accepted. They can give themselves because they find someone who listens. So then we become acquainted with their faith, their culture, their way of speaking. We enter their world. In some way, we become enculturated in them, and we are enriched. This attitude enables us to contribute to making our multicultural societies become intercultural. That is made up of cultures open to one another and in a profound dialogue of love with one another. Dear friends, inclusion can be interpreted as a kind of benign tolerance. You dwell where you dwell, and I'll dwell where I dwell. But in Christianity, and specifically within Catholicism, that is not the manner in which we engage the world. The only proper way of engaging the world is love. And in this sense, the task of Christians is to engage others. And, and by the way, the, the task of Christians is also among Christians um, engaging in this. Uh, Christians uh, ecumenically. But also at this stage, for a lot of Catholics, it's amongst Catholics. Uh, I think it may be harder for some Catholics to love one another than some Catholics to love a, someone who's Buddhist right now. This love, this Eucharistic sense of entering into relationship with another, a friendship of, gradual, of real commitment to the flourishing of another human being, even when you disagree with them. This must, this is not a task that a Christian would say that we can perform on our own. It's a task that proceeds from a dialogue of love that began in God's very inner life that was performed in the incarnation that's made available in the Eucharist and is lived each and every day in parish churches uh, throughout the world. So in conclusion, inclusion is a good. And in fact, it points towards this good, this deeper good of a participation in love that the Eucharist actually can provide a narrative to enrich, allowing schools, churches, and entire communities to understand uh, what it means to love, to be committed to one another in a, in a sense that moves beyond a benign tolerance to a real commitment to the flourishing of the other person. Thanks. so much, Tim. So we do have some time for questions. Um, this talk uh, is being recorded and will be available later, so we want to make sure that we capture your questions as well as the responses. So please come to one of the microphones if you have uh, a question for Dr. O'Malley, and uh, we'll uh, continue with that for uh, a few, as long as there are questions. How about that? If it goes too long, I'll cut you off, but it's, that's okay. <laughs> and it can be comments too, uh, not just questions. That would be very exclusionary of me. <laughs> Hello, I'm quite taken with your idea of moving beyond the kind of rational appreciation of what's going on at Mass as to say that is participation. Mm 
do we have any sense, uh, uh, are you aware of any kind of uh, metric that would help us look for other ways of saying we are connecting with people during the, the liturgy? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the metrics is, is the same way that all sorts of communication happens in our world that we know it's effective, right? Uh, if you've ever been involved in a conversation with another human being, um, which I presume you have, uh, and at least, we, at least one um, right here, the, there's all sorts of dimensions of the conversation that, that are under the surface, that aren't just sort of rational understanding, but is about something else. The example I always give is something like this. Um, if I'm in an elevator and I ask someone, hey, how about this weather? And they say, yes, how about this weather? And then they pull down a chart and say, uh, you can see the front that's been moving in this year. Right, right, you know you're participating in the conversation, surely not just on a, a kind of rational basis, but, but that you're aware of the subtlety. What I'm actually doing is saying, hey, you're a human being, I'm a human being. Um, it's kind of weird to just acknowledge that alone. So I'm using this, this kind of, this ritual uh, framework in which to engage you. I think we have to think about those dimensions of the liturgy more fruitfully, more intentionally, uh, more carefully, rather than just a matter of um, total rational involvement or necessary singing. Uh, so here's, what, here's an example I'll, I'll always give. Um, our son uh, was speech delayed and didn't sing for years. He was afraid and didn't know how to make the motions with his mouth. Uh, and so we were afraid, like, well, is he actually listening to anything? Is he learning anything? One day in the car, he just begins to sing every one of the songs. Uh, it's this degree to which uh, immersion into a world, and so, so to me, the metric will, will often, and, and here's an area of where I'm, I've done more work and am doing more work, is in aesthetic philosophy, is, is the manner in which how immersion and perception into a world forms us, uh, even before uh, we have cognition, where we have speech, um, where we can understand what's going on, and that that part of us never dies away. Um, yes, I understand most of the words of the Mass, not all. I understand them, I actually study them, but there's some part of my being that connects more fruitfully in worship when somebody uses incense and I smell it, it reminds me of my parish in second grade, which reminds me of my time in London. It, it, it's pre, it, it's just, it's inbred, or it, it created in my body. And so that, that kind of rubric, I think, is more helpful than saying, well, is everyone always saying all the words? As an Irish Catholic person who lived in Boston, like sometimes people don't say words because they, they can't, they're sad. And that's an ineffective measure. Like uh, the worst thing you could do at any mass to me is to begin with, or any liturgy, but any mass is, this, this guy did this in Boston all the time. Hey everyone, how are you? It's Boston, so the answer is angry. <laughs> a little sad, and it's dark, okay? So, um, and they would, oh, hi. That wasn't loud enough. Say it again. How were you? See, this is a moment of extreme exclusion. Because people come to Mass, sometimes full of joy, sometimes full of sorrow, and the genius of the liturgy is that it gives a space for both affections to operate alongside each other. We don't force affections, right? Uh, the resurrection is joyful, but, and we sing joyfully about it, but there's a kind of sober joy, right? It's, it's not, there, there, there's exuberance, but there's a space for that. And so, so that's the, the kind of, that's another dimension of exclusion. We, we need to be careful about that. In the name of inclusion, right? We think, oh, if everyone says hi to one another before Mass, they'll really love one another. When in fact, um, what some people most need to love one another is to offer their deepest sorrow in a community of faith to God in the silence of their hearts. And 
I never want to belong to a church that wants to exclude that person. Um, anyway, okay. So thanks for your talk. Um, when we talk about uh, participation and inclusion, we tend to think in terms of space. Um, but what also came out for me uh, underneath much of what you were saying about dialogue, um, friendship, and encounter is also about time. Um, and I'm, 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 I think of uh, what Pope Francis said about uh, how time is greater than space. Uh, and I, I'm still kind of puzzling over what that means. But time, of course, is what we seem to have so little of and what we try to fill and, and you know, um, is, is over full for us. So how, does, how do we deal with time? How does a parish community um, help us to transform our notion of time? Uh, how does the trivial time cut across our other notions of, of time? It's a great question, and I'm actually going to address it tomorrow also with the teachers. Because to me, it's the number one problem with our existence today is how we dwell in time or don't dwell in time. We dwell on a kind of calculating time, a time in which all things are reduced not to encounter, but to sort of techne, what we can do, make, time is money, right? These are not things that are inclusive. Um, if time is money, then other human beings are obstacles to money. Children, then, are obstacles to money because they are the biggest time suckers ever. Uh, there's nothing like watching a child climb stairs. Uh, it, it will be forever. And so I think one of the things we have to do, uh, and this is a kind of liturgical formation, is just learn to spend time with one another concretely within communities that matter. And those communities are going to actually, like the, the degree to which we form those communities in which we share a life or friendship with one another matters and actually is the beginning of this. I moved this year to the suburbs of South Bend, which if you are, have ever been to South Bend, it, that's, that means I have a 15-minute commute instead of an eight-minute commute. And the, we moved to a cul-de-sac with neighbors. And for the first time, I began to talk to my neighbors. I'd lived in South Bend before. I had a neighbor to the right, neighbor to the left. I never knew anything about either neighbor. Um, we adopted both our children. We brought our first child home. The, our neighbor to the left said, I didn't know you were pregnant. And we're like, we weren't. <laughs> oh, OK, cool. Uh, good to know you. And that was our first and last conversation. Uh, in our new home, there's about 15 kids who live in the neighborhood, and the parents in the summer hang outside together with a glass of wine and, or a beer and talk. And suddenly, we're included in the lives of people that I don't have to be in relationship with. Right? I have to be in relationship functionally with my spouse, legally. I owe my children a certain degree of relationship, but suddenly I have these human beings that, I, that I'm open to in a different way, and I have learned to just spend time with them. And there's an ethicist whose name I forget, uh, oh, McCarthy, who speaks about, in our society, we've moved away from open families to closed families. That is, we abide almost entirely uh, the, to, to concretize this, um, we hang out on our back porch instead of our front porch. We've closed inward. And so liturgical time, I think, reminds us that as creatures, we're made for, one, other relationships that are more important, more defining than languages of economics, of success, of fame. But at the same time, liturgical time binds a community together to spend the time with one another, it, to create the time. And in only, the only way we can get there within parishes is not just exhorting people, hey, you got to spend more time with one another at, at church, right? Come to church more. The way to do this is to teach people to spend more time with one another at all. And then 
you can start to say, you should probably come to the whole triduum or something like that. So, so I, I, it's a problem that I think is at the heart of this because it's, it, it's not having time for one another. I, I'm not sure that I did that well enough, but um, I think it's the essential, it, it is an essential question. Dr. O'Malley, you started your talk uh, with reference to football. If I might, I, I'd like to comment on that and then come back to a more substantive question. My family is from Ohio, so naturally we're Ohio State fans, and we watch uh, carefully uh, the mysterious and surprising wins of Notre Dame this year, and so <laughs> almost miraculous, some of them. You know, the, the kingdom will be full of all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my comment. You also spoke at the beginning of your talk of uh, order and coercion and whether or not inclusion could be ordered by the state. It seems to me that there's uh, um, more than sort of the legislated or, or mandated influence of the state. So that in the United States, for, for example, the concept of the melting pot really means that everybody who doesn't become American in the sense that the populace defines it is excluded. Mm -hmm. So that to me seems to me a very coercive way of doing that. And it's reinforced by acts of government in many other ways and in the, polit in the political scheme. Could you perhaps comment on, on that? Yeah, well, I, except uh, the only comment I have to start with is I absolutely agree. I mean, this is the, the thing is inclusion unto ourselves is hard and, and that's why you have to, to sort of be self-reflective. Uh, and, and for this reason, I believe that the way forward for much of this will involve state intervention, right? Like there are certain things, like I started with my son because I didn't want to seem like a troglodyte who accepts no gift of the contemporary world, right? Um, there are some that sort of speak about the age we're in and then they forget that they're only alive because um, we have penicillin. Um, so I didn't want to, I, I want to acknowledge that legal interventions need to happen uh, in the gift of my son, right? A, uh, an inclusive learning environment for a kid who could learn if only he was given the shot to learn. But that is dependent first on virtue. And virtue cannot be forced by an institution. Virtue has to have a sense of the good life, of what human flourishing is, what is the good. And that's why we need local communities, whether one's Catholic or Anglican or, uh, or, or of any sort of religious group, to propose visions of human flourishing that often the state brackets out. Uh, the state brackets it out because the state is too often influenced by the same economies of acquisition of wealth and what Pope Francis calls the throwaway culture that one doesn't notice that actually people don't love one another, don't delight in one another. And of course, inclusion within the state initially arose, as I think it's important to remember, from specific virtues that were themselves religious, right? The, the, the dignity of the human person as person. But when we forget those core dimensions, and that's what I'm saying, the state can't get to those core dimensions alone. We need local communities, local parishes, local groups of friends. Then the state is only acting as a will to power. In other words, one must do this, one must do this, one must do this, and the question is, is how many musts before you have things happen like a rejection of the state, um, and rather than a sense of what the common good is. So, so yeah, I, I can only say I agree with you, and that's why I think virtue, local community, friendship, concrete acts of love, spending time with one another, learning to deal with difficult human beings, being around people who, who are not you, those are the kinds of things, those, those, those 
local practices matter a good deal. In fact, they are the source of all, everything. Thank you for coming. This has been an incredible uh, talk. And you don't hear much about the inclusion. Um, I'm not one for the state directing what we do. As more of a community, we should be doing that. But my question is, to build a community inside your church, inclusion seems to be a way, a little bit of forcing the issue. Um, how do we foster like a community when we rush through a, a service in an hour and then we rush out, we have three masses come in, we're running on a certain time frame. The, the greeting and the means of building a community is time and getting to know each other. The greeting in the form at the start of church when we say, we're gonna pray for someone else, learn their name, and then do the pray is the start of learning other people. Because you can go to mass for years and years and years, sit in the same spot and not know the people around you. And then leave church and not have that interaction. But the way to make the church more effective is that everybody knows everybody, cares about everybody, takes a part in their lives and can help. Without helping you, without the spread of that love, we're just participants in a a, a, a set of rituals that don't really mean anything. Yeah, I, like I said, I think we have to learn to spend time. And, and, and something I've been thinking about is reclaiming real festive times, carnivalist times within our, our, our spaces. I grew up in a parish in South Florida, which was a lot of retired people. And they would do two carnivals a year. And there was a... Real, now, they weren't necessarily religious carnivals. They could have upped the religious game. There was an Irish priest there who really loved uh, uh, St. Patrick's Day and beer. And so that was really the focal point of the whole carnival. Um, but if we think about, I've been involved in parishes, for example, in Boston and other places, where a connection to a religious feast or a particular event is an occasion for the parish to do something together that, that is not just business as usual. So creating these spaces where people can belong with one another, can get together, uh, can spend time together, and actually devoting a fair amount of attention to that. Not just like an hour and a half picnic squeezed in between soccer one day and the next, but a three, four, five night event where the purpose is just delighting in one another's presence. Sharing food, enjoying time together, this is the kind of thing that probably takes effort in convincing people, but in a couple years can reap some remarkable fruits. Um, so, so to me, that's part of it, is festive time. Um, we need more festive time. We need more feasts. So this actually goes back to the liturgical year question. We need this more of this time to spend with one another. And liturgical feasts were always not just about um, a one-on-one -on -one checking off an obligation, but a real sense of, uh, of belonging to a community, to a, a, a group. That's more than a community in the case of the church. It, it, it's, it's the community of saints. Great. I like your laptop cover. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why I brought it with me. Um, so I know like you are doing a talk with, uh, with teachers uh, tomorrow, but unfortunately not one yet. So um, I was just wondering like with like you, uh, you did talk about in the beginning, like, you know, with like IEPs and how, you know, the school boards are, you know, trying to make sure like every, every child has the best, you know, education to, to their abilities. Um, I just wanted to know like if you have any thoughts on like how you know, the education system could do better in, like, I know, like, that's a very broad topic, but if you can do, like, like briefly, like, how inclusion can be increased, I guess? Sure, yeah, I can say, you know, I'm not an expert in state educational systems. Uh, all my entire experience is having a, a kid with an IEP. Uh, here's what I'll say. Um, a, a, a classroom that has those with and without IEPs is much better. My, my son learns better in that environment. Maybe not everyone, but, but the fact that there are communities where 
Um, we, we went to school, two uh, school districts, one in South Bend, and then we moved to go to another one. And, and the one separated everyone with an IEP uh, in their own place. And our son did not learn as well in that environment as he learned being around peers uh, uh, like him. So uh, I think the more that, that one can put everyone together, the better. I, I am an expert in religious education, not education. And to me, um, our, ma our lack of attention at all to educating those with special needs is dreadful. Um, what can the church do better? Literally anything. Um, like if anything is done, it is better. And I have taught multiple occasions students with special needs in religious education classrooms that were not at all prepared to deal with this situation. Um, and I know those students were capable of full participation in the Eucharistic life of the church. And I know that I wasn't able to do anything to help that. And that's dreadful. So, so there are systems out. I mean, SPREAD is a special religious education out of Chicago. Um, there's often, there's some experimenting with catechesis of the Good Shepherd as a way of working not just with um, young children, but those with special needs moving much older, uh, a kind of contemplative approach. Um, large communities are a brilliant model for religious formation, uh, particularly those with, with much more intensive um, uh, de developmental uh, and intellectual needs. And so I think until we do that uh, within the church, um, we're excluding at this stage a lot of people. Um, and th they're actually our children. Um, so. Thank you for being here tonight, Dr. Amelia. I was grateful to know that when I'm wandering the lobbies of my parish with one of my kids, I'm still participating in the liturgy. So that's good to uh, bring home tonight. I'm wondering if you could comment um, there are times when, when we hear or see people, individuals, especially in the case of politicians, who are either excluded by the church from participating fully in the liturgy. Um, I think of examples where um, maybe a bishop comes out and says to a politician who may be supporting um, abortion or some other matter to say, you uh, should not be receiving communion, or maybe in cases of excommunication. What does this say about either the church or the idea of um, liturgy and inclusion. So an easy one. <laughs> so I'm not a bishop, which is something I'm grateful for on a regular basis. And I think that at least in today's world, such an approach is ineffective, even if attempting to meet a particular pastoral need. In this sense, I think it would be far more effective for bishops in a particular diocese to get to know this politician and talk to them and actually share a conversation with this politician and to clarify face-to-face -face particular problems that, that the, the politician sort of has. And, and there could be a calcula calculation that the politician has. There could be calculations that the politician doesn't have. It doesn't mean the politician isn't going to listen, but it, but it strikes me that, that that sort of act of conversation needs to be the beginning, right? Fraternal correction uh, doesn't begin best by telling everyone, like, I, I've learned this the hard way as a teacher, is it's better to correct a student one-on-one -on -one than in front of the whole class. Um, and so in that sense, I think that's a more radical act, and, and sometimes it may need to be done. Um, and I, I, I don't want to develop the calculus for that, because again, I'm not a bishop, um, it, nor am I a politician. I do think that In this sense, uh, a real deep conversation 
about the church's deep sense of agopic, Eucharistic political wisdom is needed, and that a lot of politicians don't yet get how radically devoted to love that they could be. And so in this sense, I, I, I think it's endemic of a particular problem that it's endemic of a particular problem where it's not clear to me that many politicians recognize how much Catholicism or you know, Anglo-Catholicism or any particular sort of form of, of sort of social doctrine emerging from a religious tradition should inform every dimension of their life. And so your question's really hard, and I'm glad that, again, that I'm not a bishop. Um, I think in prudence, if I was a bishop, I would talk one-on-one -on -one with the politician and leave it up to them to make decisions on the other side. But I would talk one-on-one -on -one at least to them. For it's better, it's better to be honest with one another. Isn't this part of the difficult work of dialogue and conversation is having serious disagreements with one another face to face? Rather than through a media that to be frank is looking to turn it into a soundbite to use against each other. That's all. <laughs> so Tim, it's my, uh, my pleasure this evening to offer a few words of thanks. Um, I'll tell you what's kind of rolling around in my head right now. On, on Thursdays, I, uh, I go out and I spend a few hours at the, uh, the local jail. So maybe 350, 400 guys in the institution at any one time. And um, I had the opportunity of, of working with small groups of, uh, of men. So as today unfolded, I went down uh, to the kitchen area and I got out our, our mock kind of coffee uh, container and I rolled it down to the room and the guys were marched into their jumpsuits and we, we sat around the table and there was a big guy beside me who talked about um, you know, becoming a, a drug addict under his dad is in, is under his father's influence before he was 12. Uh, and then he's been in and out of the correction system since he was about 15. And he's probably never gonna get out of the correction system. Um, another young guy, kind of a little further up the table, a uh, similar story, came um, as an immigrant, made some bad decisions, and uh, is also looking at, you know, a long, long time in corrections. A little fellow who sat right across from me, um, who is um, is going to the courts next week, um, and he will be declared not criminally responsible for his actions, and will never be free again. And then another fellow who has an acquired brain injury and um, addiction issues uh, that was sitting to my left, and the big guy um, who's been in and out forever uh, talked about. Um, one of the reasons why he's not going to get out is because um, he's not shown any remorse and he's, uh, he's not showed any emotion. And he said in his experience, um, it's been difficult to do so because as a young man going into corrections, if you were vulnerable, um, you'd be killed, right? So the little fella at the end of the table, his name was Dean, uh, talked about being not currently responsible and going off to an institution for the rest of his life. And um, he got all choked up and began to talk about how scared he was. And he was doing this as we're, we're drinking coffee. It wasn't really coffee, but it was kind of like coffee-like beverage. And the big guy who's been in corrections, who can't be vulnerable, reached over and put his hand on the little guy's hand and said, we've got your back. And I got all choked up, eh? Because you don't expect that kind of tenderness um, in that sort of situation. And as they sat around the table and they told their story and we drank bad coffee and there was a simple gesture of affection, um, I'm hearing a lot about inclusion um, and openness and vulnerability and, a, and, and making community happen.
And in that moment, um, as I look at my day, um, it was really Eucharistic, and, and Christ was present. I, um, I haven't had the pleasure of being back at Notre Dame in, uh, in a few years now, um, and I've been living vicariously through my colleagues that have been going for the last while. And um, they've been saying over and over again um, about how much they've enjoyed the, the work that you're doing through the center, and they've talked um, in a very particular way about you and your humor and your engagement um, and your practical wisdom. Um, I also appreciate this evening um, your invitation for us to reflect on who we already are as members of Christ's body and who Christ calls us radically to be for one another. So on behalf of those of us that are gathered here this evening, um, thank you for being with us and for sharing your wisdom. Just one or two more practical things before you leave. Um, first of all, uh, for the students who are here, um, thank you for being here. I'm, I'm happy that you're here. I'd like to let you know that we have, um, ha we have approval for the Veritas Lecture Series to be part of the co-curricular record. So if you do want to come to more of these sessions, which are so worthwhile, um, that there's uh, the opportunity to have that included on your record. So uh, come and see me about that if you like. Also, um, the workshop that is tomorrow, you said you're not a teacher, you can't come. If you're available, come talk to me. We'll, we'll get you into the workshop tomorrow, okay? So um, just to, to let you know. So, so we are lucky to have uh, Tim with us tomorrow. Um, we have uh, quite a few educators. Um, we have, I think half of them are coming from here on Perth uh, School Board, so we're, we're very happy. For tonight's lecture, we, we thank uh, the London District Catholic School Board for their sponsorship as well. Uh, for tonight. I think that's it for tonight. For uh, next time, though, I would like to uh, just uh, invite you to uh, return on November 21st. The lecturer is uh, Joseph Cardinal Tobin, who's the uh, Cardinal and Archbishop uh, from uh, Newark. And uh, he will be talking about who is my mother and brother and sister, uh, or my brother and sister and mother. Um, and uh, so really continuing this theme of inclusion and how do we expand our sense of, of who is uh, part of our, our community. Um, a note about that lecture is it's on a Wednesday night rather than a Thursday. So for those of you who are here, please come back, but come on the Wednesday, November 21st. Okay, that's enough for tonight. Thank you so, so much for coming. Uh, for those who will be here tomorrow as well, I'll see you there. Um, one more round of applause for Dr. Mayer.